Oops. Go ahead, Josh. I was just going to say, let's get started in about 30 seconds. Go ahead and finish your thought, Rob. Yeah, I was just going to mention that I actually have a hidden slide here. Um, yeah, that kind of says don't build if you don't have to. Um, and then kind of talk a little bit about like trying to leverage what's out there in terms of standardization, which I think is gets to the point that you're that you're making, Rajesh, of um, that uh, working out how to leverage like templatized pieces of um, monitoring uh, configurations and, and dashboards, I guess is yeah, highly, a highly leveraged um, task. Yeah, I'd agree with that for sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll um, maybe I'll add that slide back in. Yeah. All right, guys, let's, uh, let's kick it off. So we have a good crowd getting, started here and uh, there'll be some more people joining us here shortly. So let's kick it off. We are recording this call. So, um, and we'll be sending that out later, probably tomorrow or the next day at the latest. And we'll put that up on YouTube as well. So you'll definitely have that. So welcome everybody to Cloud Native at Scale Meetup. Uh, we are a meetup community based in San Francisco uh, where we talk about all things cloud data from containers to service meshes microservices, declarative APIs, and everything in between. So feel free to reach out to us on meetup.com and Cloud Native at Scale, and you can find us there. If you would like to speak um, or help out, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. We're always looking for speakers and some help for sure. Uh, the title for tonight is Building and Running a World-Class Observability Function. And so why are we here? What's the topic? What will we be covering today? Uh, observability teams as a centralized function within IT organizations is a relatively new phenomenon. So these teams are responsible for managing the monitoring and observability tool set and empowering developers and engineering teams to push the right data into the systems to get the information that they need. So in this session, in this talk, we will cover what organizations must consider when establishing an observability function and the practical next steps on how to get started. And we'll also have a demo. So make sure to stay to the end. Uh, our host for this evening is Rajesh Iyer. Uh, Rajesh was actually a speaker earlier in the year and uh, he was so good that we brought him back. Uh, Rajesh is a senior technology and software engineering leader with over 20 years of deep and diverse experience in software architecture and engineering, uh, enterprise software and application development, delivery and global operations. Currently, he is the executive director of software engineering at JP Morgan Chase. And for those of you who don't know that JP Morgan is probably the largest bank in the world. Uh, before that, he was the platform managing ma uh, engineering manager at American Express. And then before that, he was the VP of Software Engineering at Barclays, uh, among many, many other things. So we're definitely in good hands. And Rajesh, I will kick it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Uh, so let me start by uh, introducing Rob. Uh, so Rob is the co-founder and CTO of Chronosphere. Uh, he has previously worked at Uber, where he was the technical lead of the observability team and the creator of uh, the M3 DB platform, a time series database at the core of M3. Uh, he's worked on both large engineering organizations such as Microsoft and Groupon and a handful of uh, you know, startups. Uh, he lives with his family in New York City where he mainly spends weekends exploring all of the New York City's playgrounds and also following his wife's jazz adventures. So over to you, Rob, uh, to start with the presentation. Thanks, Josh. Uh, great to uh, be here and um, be in good company uh, and um, glad we got some time to uh, talk about some of the warts of uh, moving workloads between cloud native and uh, non-cloud native environments. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, as kind of Rajesh mentioned, uh, we're, we're going to run through today on um, basically what it means to build a, a world-class uh, observability function. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen and presenting. Um, 
Wonderful. So I apologize if uh, my wife's clarinet in the background <laughs> seeps through. Somebody, um, somebody's practicing tonight. Um, yes. Uh, Rob, is it okay if people ask questions throughout? So we have a chat box. Do you want to wait till the end or do you want to uh, answer those throughout the, the talk? Why don't we um, collect the questions and then, yeah, at the end, we can race through them. Um, and if I see them while it's happening and it seems pertinent, I'll answer it at the moment. Got it, got it. Awesome. So uh, yeah, this will be brief. Um, I've kind of worked on monitoring uh, in little bits and pieces everywhere. Uh, definitely first at Microsoft, uh, uh, while on Office 365, which back then was called Microsoft Online. Um, uh, they actually worked on significant monitoring uh, tools there. And when I left, I never thought I'd do it again. Um, yet here I am uh, much later uh, with, uh, with, with at, you know, building a company with, with more than 50 employees on um, uh, trying, trying to deliver the world's best uh, SaaS observability and tooling platform at Chronosphere. And I only really got here because of the five years at Uber that we spent um, scaling uh, the telemetry monitoring and uh, metric system there, uh, which of course was also not just where M3 was born, but Jaeger, the um, open source CNCF tracing project was also born. Um, so myself and Yuri worked uh, closely together there. Um, and then, and there's also so, been some really interesting um, uh, blog posts recently on how the logging team platform there just finished their migration from Elasticsearch to a ClickHouse backend that actually speaks Elasticsearch um, in a schema-free agnostic um, uh, with a schema free agnostic query engine that sits in front of ClickHouse, which is really interesting. Um, go read up on the logging pipeline if that's of interest. Um, and so, yeah, I also contribute to Open Metrics, which is the Prometheus uh, exposition format that's been um, uh, modernized and standardized uh, and, and is now part of CNCF. Uh, so just quickly, what we're going to run through, um, we're going to look at what defining observability, uh, defining observability, what that means. Um, so what does observability mean to uh, you at, a, at um, an organization? Um, how you should think about it? Uh, the people and functions who are part of this entire life cycle. Um, and then, of course, we're going to talk a little bit about um, if you're booting up a function at a company, uh, just a really practical um, overview of what, uh, if you know, if you want to get alerts running, uh, what that might look like. Obviously, there's much more to observability than metrics and alerting, um, but it is frequently, I guess, when you put someone on call, the first thing you want to do is set up um, alerts. Uh, so, so some prag pragmatic kind of, um, what does that look like with Prometheus and uh, in a cloud native deployment? Uh, and, and then some of the architectures that you can do to scale out when uh, you, you have an uh, a, uh, architecture like this um, and you're um, looking at really uh, kind of going to the, the next level in terms of um, what you want to support as a uh, to the to your end users and developers um, around specifically metrics and monitoring and alerting. But uh, of course, as I said, that's only one part of the story. Um, just to kind of, before we jump into the content, uh, I wanted to step back a little bit and talk a little bit about the, uh, the kind of breadth of the problem that we're facing today. So there's uh, a lot of things, a lot of things that are changing when we think about um, migrating to cloud native based architecture. And uh, even just building from scratch in a cloud native uh, world, there's uh, a lot of things that are multiplying the complexity of the deployments themselves. Uh, and not just that, this um, level of complexity uh, obviously brings a lot of um, interesting things. Like on the product side, you can see here that uh, it's a lot easier to run dynamic experiments uh, to customize your product for different geographies and markets. Um, and deploy them in, in safe ways with, with um, routing meshes that handle a lot of the heavy lifting to build out this complexity for you. Um, but uh, as you can see, especially as we start to offer a more complex matrix of products, um, this kind of multiplies the complexity of what we need to be monitoring and be on top of. Uh, 
And then, of course, other outside of just that, uh, there's the fact that now a lot of these applications are built as microservices rather than monoliths, which just multiplies the uh, complexity in terms of um, the, the runtime compute as well as of the resulting telemetry data uh, because now there's a lot more interconnected calls happening and, and traffic, uh, dynamic, tra dynamic traffic patterns going on inside your, your backend. Uh, and then of course, uh, most folks are not just running on top of uh, virtual machines or, um, or bare metal anymore. Um, when you're in a cloud native architecture, your applications are typically deployed as containers. Um, and uh, this means that every compute unit is slightly smaller. And so you have a much higher number of uh, compute instances that are running your application uh, typically because you uh, run them under containers rather than and giving each container a few CPUs and a bit of memory rather than on a virtual machine or on-premise where you uh, give it a lot more, uh, you give it all 16 cores if you're running 16 core machines and, and things like that. So all of this is exploiting the data um, that, uh, that people are collecting to be able to instrument and, and monitor uh, their distributed system applications. So I wanted to kind of talk about the journey at, at Uber real quick uh, to, to highlight how this um, happens. So you can see down the bottom here, um, the product's getting much more complex. Um, the products we talk about here is, you know, things like Uber Eats, Uber X, Uber Black. Um, and then of course, when we went into more and more cities and more geographies, we're now, we were customizing that. So some cities have Uber Scooter, Uber, um, uh, every mo Uber Bicycle, every mode of transport you could imagine because some um, different regions had different localized products there. Um, so you can see that, but you know, the other, of course, huge multiplier here is going from monoliths to, um, to microservices with uh, like a 4,000 X multiplier on the level of telemetry and complexity that you had kind of have to operate. Uh, and then of course, you know, going from tens of physical hosts to millions of containers um, is uh, the other multiplier and uh, complex, both in terms of complexity and telemetry um, uh, data as well. Uh, so, you know, uh, in 2015, company was running Graphite um, uh, with basically um, uh, in, in a default kind of Whisper backend configuration. So the um, Whisper database keeps one time series profile. Um, and uh, it, it's, uh, it's obviously um, historically been a very uh, powerful monitoring tool. Um, and for Uber, it, well, it powered the majority of the time metrics and alerting there. Um, so uh, I won't go into the, the logging and the tracing platform, but just to see the kind of the growth of telemetry data and how it affected the metrics platform, um, you can see that uh, we needed to basically scale that out um, with in a way that was fault redundant and could meet um, the level of scale of billions of time series. And so Elasticsearch and Cassandra was replaced with the storage, but the core product of Graphite stayed there. And then later out, we built um, Prometheus, which was a much, Promethe the Prometheus data model and um, and ran a, a bunch of Prometheus instances at, at Uber and backed that up with a, a native storage solution uh, that we wrote from scratch, which is M3B and part of the M3 open source project. Um, so by the end of it, uh, we, whoops, we were, uh, yeah, basically ingesting 1.5 billion data points um, per second. And we had about 10 to 11 billion time series in there. Um, and so those data points actually all get aggregated together and produce um, roughly 50 million uh, unique uh, time series with samples being written per second. Um, so uh, a lot of aggregation of like raw telemetry data being aggregated into a sync, you know, into a much um, more coarse view and then uh, stored um, to, to give that view into the millions of containers that, that ran applications there. So what is observability? Uh, most folks might start by saying it's some, something along the lines of metrics, logs, and traces, and then you set 
set it up, uh, set those products up, and um, suddenly you have observability. Uh, obviously, that's uh, you know we kind of feel that it's those are the means, not the ends. Um, the end and what you're striving for is this life cycle and uh definitely this has um, obviously been a large uh part of input to like how how we build uh product and how we think about uh observability and monitoring tools in general um and uh the it's pretty pretty simple we start with no being the most important aspect of observability so the knowledge aspect um, and empowering folks to be able to uh, understand their systems um, and ultimately, uh, which can help lead to getting notified before something is wrong in the system. Um, I, ideally, it's before. If it happens while there's something wrong and a user is experiencing a problem, at least that's not after the user is experiencing a problem. But ideally, we find out before um, and obviously, we want to be able to explore um, how our system, even healthy systems are, are working and look at the performance of that um, over time and also understand how experiments are rolling out and how them at a business and application level are performing uh, so that you can under, you can uh, you know react in the moment or um, plan ahead uh, in, in terms of your product development as well so that's the first tier we think about. Um, and then, you know, obviously the second tier is triaging this data, basically using this data to, to be, uh, to act. Uh, and so as everyone knows, uh, the first thing you should do during an outage is roll something back or uh, mitigate the outage uh, before you understand what's going on. It's very tempting it, during an outage to, uh, basically say, oh, I know what this bug is. I'm going to write a fix for it and deploy it and roll that out immediately. We don't think that's the, that that's jumping straight to the root cause and the fix. And it's actually more dangerous because of course, if you do that, you uh, are introducing further change into a very complex system that's more likely to actually uh, break something else in an unknown way. So we, we always think it about I think about it as finding out what the what and then acting and mitigating on that what. Um, so whether that's like uh, rolling back or routing traffic somewhere or turning something off um, to allow the happy path to, to continue for folks. Um, that's what we think about when we're talking about triaging. Um, and obviously, ideally, you can remediate, you can get to your golden remediate step immediately from that point. Um, and then, uh, of course, after all of this understanding what went on and how, like the interconnection of your system and um, how events led from one thing to another um, is uh, extremely important. Uh, and that, that is the, um, the third, third uh, tier we like to think about when thinking um, what fundamental things are you doing as part of, as part of an observability practice. So, so Rob, uh, a question here, right? So what, yeah. uh, uh, do you think logs are uh, outdated and uh, observability is the way to go? Or do you think logs and observability are, uh, I mean, when I say, uh, you know, telemetry data through Prometheus, are they complementary to each other? Oh, they're most definitely complementary, yes. And I think, I think it really, um, depending on uh, like the knowledge aspect, for instance, if a lot of what you're experiencing is a problem due to very like a, a small set of events that are particular. So you can imagine um, there's a certain code flow that when uh, you say a credit card number plus a credit card type plus an expiry for some reason uh, cause like a panic or a um, uncaught exception in an, in a, in a downstream system, that is um, that's really a single event able to affect large change and metrics aren't really going to get you there right the knowledge you're not even able to fulfill the full knowledge aspects because sure you might see um things in the metrics pointing you to a, a like an instance restarting but you're not you don't have the knowledge without the log or the description of the event of what led to that so i really think about um 
logging being most valuable uh, in the knowledge section. Um, and, but usually I guess uh, most folks are starting with metrics in terms of when they get, when an alert gets triggered, um, if that makes sense. So uh, yeah, if you, that, that's, that's, I think like how it's, um, and I, I think that, uh, yeah, it, it, it is blurring. We are starting to see some lines blurred though, where um, the high, the extra level of high cardinality that is being offered in kind of telemetry systems in general are, um, it's blurring the lines a little bit, but I still think that lot, like for certain types of outages that aren't performance related or aren't capacity related or aren't change related, um, loggings and events are the only way to see that. Yep, makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, great question. So, and yeah, I think like, I, this is what I, keeps me excited. I, I'm more than happy to work on observability for 10 more years because I think that that story is going to continue to evolve. Um, anyway, uh, just talking a little bit about like responsibilities um, for if you show up on day one and you try to set up an observability function at an organization, these are some things that you really need to get uh, right. Um, and so the first one is people are going to look to you to define the monitoring standards and practices. Um, this includes documentation, guides, uh, and uh, thought leadership. So it's it's about the um, it's about the how that folks should perform monitoring, but it's also the why they should be doing it, uh, and uh, the the kind of um, aspects that are best those best practices, such as you know endeavoring for a low uh, number of alerts per on-call shift or um, uh, looking for a run book to be presented at every single um, high urgency alert that wakes someone up so that they at least have one jumping off point to look into before while they're trying to mitigate a problem. So it's, it's, it's not just the, the how, it's also the why and um, kind of delivering that to the company. So then there's delivering um, the actual implementation. Obviously, most folks are spend a lot of time here and uh, rightly so, because this is um, basically delivering a product to your developers. Um, and so uh, whatever that looks like, whether it's um, uh, connecting all your applications uh, and, and uh, making sure that they all write to Splunk or whether it's you're running your own Kafka pipeline, Kafka pipeline and um, delivering logging data to Elk, or if it's, um, of course, using Prometheus and Grafana or Datadog or something like Chronosphere, uh, which is, which is um, uh, Prometheus compatible, you know, all of that, uh, all of that is the implementation and delivery phase. Um, and so once that's there though, measuring and managing this um, picture, uh, is, is really important. So basically working out how well you are doing as a team in terms of the reliability and stability of your own monitoring um, uh, will go a long way to maintaining the trust with end users. Um, and, uh, and then of course, um, measuring how often uh, there are uh, gaps in the system, whether that's feature-based um, or, uh, or just simply things that are that are going un, uninstrumented um, and are uh, you know very uh, are very opaque, opaque to and 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 cannot be kind of seen into. You never want it to feel like there's you you can walk into a dark room at any corner, uh, depending on what part of the system you're working on um, at, at your organization. Um, and then there's management. So managing the tools um, and, uh, and this needs to be simple. You know, if you, if you can onboard without to, uh, um, to logging metrics and tracing with only using the standard um, client libraries at your company um, without even having to explicitly turn them on, that's the ideal world. Uh, and um, we'll kind of, uh, look a little bit, I'll give you a good reason on the, the slide after this, why you might, will definitely want to think about that. Um, so uh, who should do this? Uh, basically- Rob, question yes. on the last, last point, right? Right. Uh, 
when you say manage the tooling and storage of metrics data, why is that important? Right. So um, there's a lot of opinionate opinionation uh, opinionated um, decisions you kind of need to make when uh, setting up and delivering the like a monitoring tool to the rest of your organization, such as what is the retention that I'm going to keep of this monitoring data? Um, at what granularity am I going to uh, to look at it? Um, uh, am I going to sample any logs? Um, it's interesting. We we started sampling uh, certain um, event logs for regular hot, like health heartbeats, for instance, at at our at, at Cornicea recently, um, which. Like so unsurprisingly, I suppose, cut a large percentage of the volume of our logging traffic going to our cloud provider down. Um, so, so there's a lot of like micro decisions to be made there. Um, and, and that's and, and uh, so the configuration that happens at the macro level that everyone gets and affects everyone, those have very large impacts uh, because it, they're a multiplying effect. And so that's what I mean around that, I suppose. Um, and um, also sometimes like some of the global configurations you make there, retention, so say you make a decision of, I wanna keep 30 days of data for the majority of this stuff, that affects everyone, obviously. So um, at different organizations, if that's not okay, and you do have an, enough custom requirements, then you'll probably want to go and make it possible and easy and frictionless for folks to change a different one team's retention of certain telemetry data versus another's. Um, so that's that's uh that's generally what I mean there in in that there's there's a lot of the the management aspects and configuration aspects around that that um that can be force multipliers when done correctly. Yep. Awesome. You would typically fold that into your best practices and you know. Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting because like I feel that the best practices um, is uh, definitely wonderful um, and empowers folks to do the right thing because they know what the right thing is, and then as as frequently as possible, it's ideal as well to kind of make um, some of these things as self service as possible. So uh, you know, if if you can offer uh, a one-click solution or a or a Git repository that automatically configures storage for a team, um, that's going to like enable that team to to go um, uh, do the do the thing that works best for them, um, and uh, and so I guess there's a certain aspect of it is best practices, and then the other aspect of it is um, making the platform self-service enough um, that uh, with the right control mechanisms mechanisms as well. You don't want someone to just go and say, I want 20 years of telemetry storage at five second metrics granularity. Um, so there's that um, that management aspect of it, which um, ideally is as self-service as possible to end users that, that is also uh, there. Yep, makes sense. Brilliant. Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, getting these things right at an organization goes a, a really long way. Um, and then what we want, would like to dive into just briefly here is kind of the who um, and what roles. Uh, so, you know, most folks start out with observability and monitoring being a shared function. Um, so usually either done by SREs or, or DevOps uh, roles um, or operation folks like in on a per team basis so in a decentralized way or centrally by um that arm of say sre or operations uh at uh at a company in a central fashion but still shared so you know kind of piecing it together with certain folks from that sre arm perhaps um basically doing it in part of their job um and then of course there's the dedicated function where within SRE or reporting up through SRE, you have a dedicated observability team. Um, and then it, it really depends where you are on the spectrum of, of growth and um, where the organization is, uh, to which one of those you wanna 
basically choose for, for, for you. Um, and obviously that, that will change over time as well. Um, at, at Uber, it, it first was uh, decentralized, then it was centralized, but under SRE, and then it was completely centralized and as its own dedicated team that reported up through SRE and infrastructure. Um, and then of course, when uh, you really need to make decisions about when you're going to make an increasing level of investment in these things. And, uh, you know, especially if you're having reliability problems and unable to meet your um, service level objectives to as a product, um, or if customers are finding out problems before you are frequently. Um, and I would say frequently is like more than once every few months. <laughs> you never ever want a customer to, to, to be telling you about a, a, a serious issue uh, before uh, you know about it. Um, and then of course, ramping up in, in cloud native, uh, in general, you'll be dedicating some, um, some infrastructure efforts here. Um, uh, and, um, that's, it, it's important to, um, dedicate at least some time when you do that to, to get monitoring, right. It, it's when you are lifting a workload from one runtime environment to another, um, it's, it's a lot easier to make a change at that point rather than bring along your legacy system and repurpose it um, and, then, and then make a second migration later. Um, I just saw Sanjeev ask about uh, you, what about um, self-healing systems and, and where does that lie in the spectrum of priorities? Uh, I'll actually, I actually do have a slide on that coming up um, and uh, I'll talk about it at that time, but great question. Cause that's also, I think uh, the nirvana that most folks once they're doing this function um, like would like to, to shoot for. Um, so rolling into, you know, what does, um, what, what does a small team do? Um, how do they stay focused? So this is really interesting stat. Um, well, I first wanted to say more data is not better. Uh, it's like, you're only making it harder as a small team to manage everything. Um, really what you're trying to do is model the system as it uh, exists in real world uh, back to how a human uh, mentally models it and thinks about the system. So you're really bridging reality with the human mental model and giving folks a way to navigate um, uh, the space between those. Um, and so uh, thinking about this a little bit more, you, the, a GitLab survey this year showed that only 26% of developers instrument their code for production monitoring, uh, which is up from 18% supposedly in 2020. Uh, you know, take these numbers as a rule of thumb, but basically um, this goes to show that you need to do that, that mapping and that automatic instrumentation of your systems um, in a way uh, that folks can use that um, without them having to go instrument their code at all. So I'm talking about logs from your um uh from your your reverse proxies so like nginx hj proxy um those kind of things like if you if you have rpcs that are failing or http requests that are failing you want to see what the details of those are um and you want to see it look at those events and similarly you want to see the metrics for um that traffic uh you want to see the cpu and the memory of your um containers, like all of those are basic things. And then honestly, you at an organization, the highest value you get is then mapping your business um, on top of that as well, or your applications. So, um, you know, if you have a standard way of calling other services, you have a standard set of databases, you have a standard um, set of other things, making those automatically be uh, monitored and that monitoring being available. So showing people like, the, the um, you know, the limit of a size of a MySQL table automatically um, is, is really important. So um, that, that will give, that will provide an outsized impact um, using a small team. And of course, don't build if you don't have to um, look for the most user-friendly vendor or open source tooling. Uh, I would say here, what you really want to do is maximize for future proofing. So you want to choose the, the upcoming best standards and, um, and uh, look at where the industry is headed and then choose the tools and uh, platforms and vendors that are aligned with that. Um, 
so that you don't have to do another migration very soon. Uh, it's there's a lot of tools and platforms and ecosystems out there. Um, all of them will have their own attributes and their pros and their cons. But really, what you really want to be doing is uh, future proofing your work that you're doing today, rather than. So sometimes it might make sense not to get the thing that um, provides you total coverage in terms of like APM or something like that today. Um, if that the rest of the platform is, is just not going to match up with where you're going with your cloud native deployment. So really think about future proofing here and, and trying to um, peer into the future and, and make the choices that are going to lead to foundations that you can build on for a very long time. Um, and then uh, looking at the internal KPIs and metrics um, of what you do as, as a team, um, this is just some, some really brief numbers. Um, and I'm gonna try to speed up a little bit here because I do see the demo is, takes a few minutes. So I should, I should get through this content, but um, you know, how many full-time engineers should be on a dedicated observability team um, or, or even as part of a shared SRE team? Um, What's really interesting, so, you know, at Uber, we had initially two and two of the hundred engineers um, and I joined just after it was a, it was a, at the hundred engineer mark. Um, so initially there were two engineers that a percentage of their time, um, uh, like 50% probably for uh, quite a few months was spent on, on monitoring and observability. Um, and then once we got to about 500 engineers, that's when we pulled the trigger um, on a dedicated observability function. That's when M3 started, as well as Jaeger um, and uh, the folks that were running uh, the, the logging and elk infrastructure started to hand that over to, to a dedicated team. Um, and then, so that's 1% there, but honest, yeah, but I would say that 1% of a dedicated team, you know, that eventually became 2% of a, of, of a dedicated team with 50 and, and 2,500. So you're looking at somewhere between one to 2%, whether it's shared or dedicated, that'll depend on the organization. Um, and then I, I think that's probably, you could, you get a, huge leveraging effect from this, this investment. So it's, it's a worthwhile thing. The 2% that you're deploying will um, return massive outsized value to your uh, ability to build a complex and reliable system at a speed of development, which is meets, you know, the very best of engineering teams in the, in, in the rest of the world. So this, this investment really pays dividends. Um, and Can in terms of the, uh, Avery Josh, yeah. Of course. Uh, um, so how, uh, so question on the uh, developer and SRE feedback loop, right? Uh, right? How are the developers involved in the SRE and how is the SRE sort of giving that feedback loop back to the development teams? Uh, how does, how in, in your experience, how has that worked? Yeah, um, that's a really uh, interesting question. I, I think that um, it varies from organization. Uh, it's, the, t the feedback loop is can be much tighter actually when you have decentralized SREs. So you have an SRE embedded in each team um, because obviously the SREs are very close to the team itself and they're kind of um, doing work on behalf of the team. Um, however, uh, you miss the unifying, I see all of the uh, problems in one place um, from what you get with a dedicated SRE team. Um, ideally you have a little bit of both, like your largest product teams have embedded SREs and then you have a central, a strong central SRE, um, uh, function as well. Um, and, uh, a lot of the, um, a lot of the problems from, you know, the really highly specialized team can be surfaced from the embedded SREs there. Uh, and then, you know, relying on NPSs and setting up office hours um, from the central SRE team goes a long way to collecting the feedback from the other teams that are relying on the self-service aspects uh, of the ecosystem that the central SRE team is is uh, developing. Um, that's what I've seen work, but I, I think, you know, I, I, yeah, NPSs and office hours uh, and NPS surveys and, and um, holding frequent office hours is, generally how I've seen the, the best high bandwidth kind of feedback work. Um, and 
Yeah, so that, that kind of gets to exactly how you measure your success. Uh, we feel uh, a lot of the time can be done by looking at those NPS scores on how, how you're doing, um, because the rest of your engineers will have a, a sometimes even a better idea than you, of, of course, of, of how you're doing there, um, especially sometimes since you're so close to the problem, you may not understand that some of these like tools and uh, best practices and guides you've written are actually fairly esoteric and only certain advanced users at your company even know how to use some of the tools. Um, so those are super valuable to be doing. Uh, and then of course, just looking at the postmortems. Um, I, I really love to do this. Just take like a month's worth of postmortems, read them. Um, either you don't have to read the, the outcomes of them, um, but even just the, the executive summary of each one, of which is usually only a paragraph two, paragraph or two, and just seeing the impact of them. And any high impact ones, tying them back to like, okay, well, that was at a huge outage for that long because it was a gap in monitoring. Did it take them that long to respond because they didn't even know it was a problem? Why? Well, you know, were they using the tools wrong? Or did we just have a gap there in general of like that thing was monitored? Um, those are all super valuable things. Uh, to be, to, to be doing to measure how, um, how successful you are. Um, and then in terms of the actual like infrastructure cost, uh, you know, we built in, a, a, we at Uber, it was at 1.8% of the entire hardware footprint was dedicated to um, running to, like telemetry and monitoring systems. That was, an, that was at a peak. Um, we brought that back down to three to five, th three to, um, three to four to five percent by the time I left. Uh, but that, you know, part of that was literally going and building systems specifically for that, those workloads. So, um, you know, it's going to look different uh, depending on the company. And also it depends on how liberal you are with allowing folks to just onboard onto the telemetry system. So um, for instance, you know, Netflix, uh, is similarly very liberal as well and had a few billion time series um, just in their met metrics product. Um, uh, Uber, we had 12 billion. Um, uh, and um, whereas, you know, at, at other places, and, uh, they guard um, and specifically require sign up from central SRE sometimes to onboard large, like, logging metrics uh, and, uh, and and other use cases onto their telemetry systems. So, um, you know, you can have a the spectrum of like really liberal folks um, that are okay spending on this because they know it has such a high leverage point for the company um, towards the other side where it's, it's much more controlled um, and, uh, and kind of, um, which leads to it making it easier to control the costs of course as well. Um, but you don't, get that kind of freedom as a developer to just uh, go and in instrument um, uh, which, which, you know, can pay, you can pay later in terms of either outages or um, other, other, and like it might slow down R and D because you don't have the insights into how your experimentation platform is working and um, uh, that kind of thing. Anyway, hey, Rob, Rob, I apologize for button in here, but um, no worries, are we going to have enough time for a demo? I believe so. When's, when's the hard stop? The hard stop is at the top of the hour. So I just want to make sure. Yeah. Okay, great. Let me, let me um, skip through a bit of this. I think some folks will be uh, fairly familiar with Prometheus uh, as well. So um, I'll give the high levels here. Thank you for reminding me, Josh, um, that uh, basically um, Prometheus has gotten extremely popular uh, since uh, it kind of began in 2014. Um, we, you know, back in 2016, these are anonymized stats from uh, Grafana installations. There were 2,800 Prometheus instances report being reported back um, uh, two years ago in 2019. Uh, that's multiplied up to 240,000. And this is, you know, similarly riding the same wave as folks are uh, with the popularity of Kubernetes because Prometheus is the de facto um, monitoring tool uh, for metrics specifically, not for, for logs or traces, but for metrics. So, um, you know, getting really pragmatic here, uh, like you've, you've got, you migrating to, uh, to cloud native or you're, you're building on cloud native, um, you want to set up an alert um, metrics and alerting system so that you can go have your engineers go and call. Um, 
once you get started with Prometheus, some of the pain points you might see are, you know, it's, it's not designed um, uh, in the single uh, node version to handle uh, uh, region failures or availability zones going down. Um, there is an HA model, but it doesn't uh, cover basically providing reliable gapless um, monitoring for when there's failures. Um, you might be able to keep going with it in real time, but if you switch back to a failed instance, you'll have a gap in, in that monitoring data. Um, and so uh, scalability is very difficult and so is efficiency. Um, uh, you have to keep all the data, data raw um, and it's, it's kind of um, hard to scale out the long-term storage of it just using a single disk. So you have two kind of options here. You uh, can use a Prometheus native SaaS vendor. Um, so, and when I talk about Prometheus native, I'm basically saying it's Prometheus on the way in. Um, so you have your Promethe, like you, you basically have Prometheus metrics coming out of your um, Kubernetes applications. Um, and I go all the way to your SaaS vendor and it's also Prometheus on the way out. So when you query it, when you set up your alerts, when you set up dashboards, it's Prometheus. Um, whereas obviously there are some vendors out there where the former is true, but not the latter, um, <clears throat> which really locks you into certain vendors. And um, again, it's, it's not really a great foundation because now you can't use a lot of the tooling and standards that are um, out there. Uh, and so, and then of course, there's the open source Prometheus remote storage option. So um, continuing to use Prometheus and scale it out yourself uh, with um, some kind of backend, uh, the remote storage systems out there. Of course, I, I'm biased in my preference here because I uh, work on one, um, which is M3, but there's uh, plenty of other great ones out there as well. Um, Thanos is extremely popular and, and Cortex is another. Um, both of those are in C and CF actually as well, um, alongside Prometheus, uh, but Prometheus is at a higher maturity level. Um, so an example of what essentially horizontally scaling this out with something um, like M3 looks like, um, you have many, many Prometheus instances or you're running the Prometheus agent, um, which is basically a, a headless Prometheus. Um, and you send data to this central system, uh, which you can horizontally scale out. Um, and uh, then you can use something like Grafana to query all that data. Uh, and so, what what that kind of looks like let's run through a demo of this um it's it, it's fairly straightforward once architecturally um you know you basically it looks as similar to running prometheus um, yeah, just a quick question so the prometheus yeah. uh, do they have data stores internally within them or they are just uh, pushing the data to the coordinator right great question so um you can run in both models. Uh, you can run where Prometheus does have local storage and uh, scrapes and keeps like a certain few hours or a few days of retention if you like. Um, uh, or you can use um, something like the Prometheus agent, which is, is relatively new. Grafana um, uh, has donated their Grafana agent to the Prometheus project, um, or at least that's, that's in flight perhaps. Uh, but anyway, that's that agent itself uh, basically um, writes Prometheus remote write format and uh, supports all of the service discovery mechanisms that Prometheus does today. Um, and so will act like a headless Prometheus um, since it won't keep any data other than the data that has been that that is buffered to be sent to something like Envy coordinator. Um, so, uh, so yes, you can use multiple options there. Uh, I'm going to show what it looks like with Prometheus with a very short-term storage um, uh, provisions. So I'm going to uh, jump out of here. Um, so Rob, I think um, just a time check. I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, I got I got to be that guy. But um, are you okay with running maybe five minutes late? Yeah, no, I, I'm more than happy to go five minutes over. Okay. That'd be great. Um, so, uh, yeah, we have uh, basically a, uh, a small demo here. Um, you can follow along yourself at github.com m3dbx, which has our 
extra repos. Um, and then M3 dash workshop. There's also a, uh, a guide here on the M3B documentation on how to, to run M3 in a Kubernetes cluster using the Kubernetes operator, which um, at Qantas here and, and, uh, and at Uber um, is being used in production for, you know, clusters with hundreds of database nodes in them. So um, if you are running a Kubernetes, the Kubernetes operator is a recommended way how to do this. Um, this workshop uh, is kind of more of a, an example um, of, of, and it sets up this basic architecture where you have two Prometheus instances, token to M3 coordinator, and you have three database nodes um, with three replicas um, and Grafana pointing at M3 query. So the first thing is you clone the repo, uh, which I've happened to do here already. Um, and then we uh, basically run as stop, step one says here, docker compose up. I'm using dash D so it'll run in, in daemon mode. Uh, and then um, this docker compose network will come up and basically connect things all together like we, we mentioned here. Um, and so as this comes up, I will also uh, talk through a little bit about the configuration that goes on here. So um, as we move into the step about exploring um, the Prometheus data source, we'll see that Prometheus is set up and, and scraping some of our applications um, because we told it to, uh, but it's not sending anything to M3. So we'll, we'll look at exactly what that looks like. Um, if we go and we look at the Prometheus config for that, you can see here that we set up um, static scrape jobs to go and scrape Prometheus metrics from uh, Prometheus itself, um, from the entry coordinator and from the three database node roles. Okay, so uh, things are coming up, um, running, uh, yeah, multiple database nodes, multiple Prometheus nodes, and, uh, and we have M3 coordinator as uh, part of the, the write path and M3 query as part of the read path. And so the, the reason why you wanna do that is so you can separate out um, failures in your write and reads layer. You don't want a really large query to out of memory and then interrupt your, um, your write uh, data pipeline. So that's why you typically wanna separate out, separate out uh, query and uh, ingest roles here. Um, so back to, back to uh, the demo. So we have all these containers up now. Um, if I go and uh, log in, uh, as it tells me here to um, localhost 3000, um, we'll get to Grafana. So in this example, so I'm gonna log in with admin admin and skip resetting the password. Uh, we'll see that we now have three data sources here. One that points to each of these Prometheus, which is basically set up in HA because they're both ingesting and scraping the same data. Um, and the third one pointing to this M3 query instance we talked about. So uh, now if we go and look at the dashboards we set up, uh, we can find, we actually imported some, we made some available um, already here. You can see here that uh, Grafana um, is uh, pointed to Promethe the Prometheus data source to render metrics and it's showing metrics that it's scraped from itself. So it's telling us um, the different metrics that are uh, being scraped from the different scrape jobs. So you can see we're scraping metrics from um, M3DB, M3 coordinator and Prometheus roles. Uh, and then if we go and look at the M3DB node um, details uh, dashboard, you can see here that uh, we don't um, we don't have any uh, there's there's no data flowing. We'll have some CPU stats being reported, um, some memory stats, but um, there's no reads or writes uh, happening here uh, to to the M3 DB cluster. So we're going to change that. Um, so what does that look like? Uh, sorry, git stash list. Uh, this is a change I prepared earlier, so git stash show p. Um, so basically, we're going to take that config that we saw over here um, that was uh, commented out for Prometheus remote write and remote read, 
and basically uh, turn on Prometheus to both write and read to these M3 uh, instances using Prometheus Remote Write and Remote Read. So I'm going to apply that um, <clears throat> apply that a diff. Um, so now you can see that we've uncommented out these configs. Um, and then if we go back to the workshop, uh, we can see that um, there's a way to restart these instances. Um, and the instructions for what I did just, just did then is also described here. So we go and do that. This will um, now restart Prometheus instance one and Prometheus instance two and have them start writing, forwarding that metric data to um, M3 itself. Uh, so that's done for the first instance, done for the second. And now when we transition back to Grafana here, we look at the last few minutes, uh, we should start to see if the demo gods are kind to me, um, metrics starting to flow uh, into M3DB. The demo um, gods can be fickle. <laughs> they can be. They can. They, they definitely can be. I've experienced that a few times. Um, and uh, and, act and actually, um, some of the other things that we can look at while we, uh, we can go and visit the Prometheus um, UI here, uh, we can go look at the configuration. We can now see that, yeah, the remote write and remote read have been loaded in. Um, and then uh, also, um, I, yep, as okay, demo gods are kind to me today, uh, we can start to see that the uh, database ro role is now receiving um, writes and reads uh, and um, for re receiving forwarded metrics from, um, from, from me, Prometheus itself. And so, um, you know, architecturally, how this scales out is uh, we essentially, basically, um, uh, you can architecturally expand this N3DB cluster as, as large as you like. And as I said, it scales to like hundreds of database nodes. Um, and then you, you can just add more Prometheus producers in front of the coordinator here. Uh, so that's a general architecture. Um, so how, I does feel it, like, how does the query uh, go to the multiple databases? I mean, is there a, is a partition strategy there or, or how do you great, do it? Yeah, great question. Uh, it's basically uh, a quorum read and write semantics. Um, so uh, essentially the, uh, the, the, the query service knows which shards are owned by which database nodes and which shards are replicas um, of each other. So if you had a thousand shards in your N3DB cluster um, and three replicas, you'll have uh, three times that. So more than 3000 shards um, or 3072. And then basically it works out which ones are the, pet, uh, sorry, the triplets. And it, it makes sure to read from at least um, two out of three of each of the triplets um, and then merges that data together to give you a consistent quorum read of the data. Um, and similarly on the right path, it makes sure that for each metric, it makes it to two of the three of the triplets um, so that uh, when the data is merged and read, um, you'll always get the consistent view of what went in. So that's, that's how these database nodes in the middle can experience tolerate um, failures um, but as long as there's not more than a uh, more than one out of three in a triplet that experiences a failure, then um, you have a consistent view of data even with um, those uh, instances um, encountering problems. Uh, great. Well, I see we have some questions. Um, I, I it's interesting. I, I think um, the one that how about using observability for health, self healing healing systems? I guess. I uh, was remembering a slide that maybe I took out. <laughs> so, um, in terms of uh, in terms of that, though, just briefly as I wrap up here, like once you've got this established, once you have like the fundamentals established at a company, you know the observability 2.0 is about better controls, better self service, um, auto remediation by rolling back deployments based on well known sig when well known signals go bad. Um, uh, you know. Eight more than somewhere, uh, this is obviously a number that I pull from the sky, but a lot of people agree that 60 to 80% of, um, you know, uh, roughly uh, incidents um, that occur are due to changes in the system. So simply rolling back from a change when known health signals go bad 
are um, a really great way to get to auto remediation. And that could even just be all your alerts that you already have set up and monitor on. So you can reuse a lot of the hard work you've done there to, to, to define health signals through your system. Um, but yeah, these are some of the things you'll want to do uh, as when, when you get to a more advanced um, state of the world. Um, but yeah, try uh, try the workshop um, if, if you'd like, if, if you want to, it's, it's at that, that URL, um, that QR code will get you there too. Uh, and um, yeah, thank you, Rajesh. Thank you, Josh. Would love to, to answer some more questions, but um, this was a great opportunity. So yeah, thanks this for was, having me. This was fantastic. Action packed, content packed. Um, so we're gonna go a few minutes late just because uh, I think we're on a roll here. Um, and let's answer some of these questions, uh, Rob, if you don't mind. Um, I'm not sure if you answered that. Uh, how do you think of security and observability? No, I didn't. I'd, I'd be interested to hear uh, your opinion on this, Rajesh. Uh, you know, I think that, um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you, you can take a first stab and I can follow sure, up. Sure, sure. So since I've uh, worked in banks, right? I mean, it's a uh, PII data is obviously a no-no in, in terms of, uh, you know, putting that in the logging information, right? Or in the log data, right? Uh, so I think uh, security, the way, the way we handle security in observability data is to make sure that, first of all, there is no PII data in the, in the, Observability, observability metrics or the logs, whatever, whatever uh, source of uh, mechanism that you have. And even if you have to, let's say, send some information, let's say there's a credit card number or whatever, right? We mask that data, right? So let's say you basically mask the data and put the last four or something, right? Where, where uh, there's not enough information so that even if that data gets hacked, uh, you know, you're not, you're not uh, losing customer information, right? So that is that is the way to handle security in you know observability data. I mean, of course, right. you have controls over uh, you know who can access the data. You know whether it is physical security, data at rest, uh, transport level security. All of those good things are there. But in terms of you know sending the data itself, we have to make sure that uh, PII data gets either uh, removed or masked when we send the data. Right, definitely. And, and I think, um, I'm sure you'll agree with me that that audit logs obviously is another huge thing that security teams obviously invest in um, and observability teams can help out with. Um, uh, but I have found quite frequently that the requirements are usually somewhat significantly different for just in terms of like the pristineness, the sensitivity of the audit logs themselves and um, that kind of thing obviously means that it's not usually the observability team just saying, hey, here's the standard logging like thing at the company, go nuts. It's, sometimes it can definitely be a lot more than that um, to get proper audit logging in place. Absolutely. Awesome. I um, hope that was good. So Ma Maven, um, sorry, I probably mispronounced your name, um, is asking how to handle federation in hybrid environments. Really interesting question. Uh, I think that I'm going to talk to the monitoring aspect of that and then Rajesh and any extra info I think would be interesting. Um, every organization will approach this differently, right? So some folks um, doubling down the spend uh, may make sense for them to replicate monitoring data to two regions, for instance, um, if they're centrally collecting it elsewhere. Um, other folks, uh, you know, are, are, are cost sensitive, obviously, and, um, uh, and, and it depends on the data, like some data may make sense to go to two regions, um, and then some other data to only stay in a single region. Um, uh, so you can split it by BIP telemetry data, um, depending on like what you want in a kind of disaster scenario. Um, but in general, uh, you know, you, you can, the, the major models are um, keep it uh, local, which if you're doing on premises is desirable because the egress costs are high um, and then kind of hybrid, uh, sorry, and then federate the data at query time. So you're collecting data from everywhere that lives locally near the compute environments. Then the other model is central single regional storage 
Um, and then the third one is probably, you know, multiple regional storage with copies of it. With, but obviously the cost magnifies um, with that ladder deployment model. Um, but yeah, any, um, what, what do you, do you have uh, other thoughts around mannering federation, Rajesh? Uh, I mean, uh, well, uh, I think, uh, in, uh, again, coming from uh, uh, like a highly regulated bank kind of environment, right? I think federation probably uh, uh, is, uh, again, a no-no, right? I mean, or, I mean, there would be use cases where you, you may have to do it, but then I think the data is usually kept local, right? Because again, again, right. from a audit and compliance reasons perspective, right? So you don't want to spread the data across uh, if you don't have to, right? So. Yeah, yeah, th that's really interesting. Yeah, I think, um, and in that model as well, I guess, um, yeah, the, the federation happening at query time is very important then <laughs> yeah. and joining that data from, from exactly. many places, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sanjeev, uh, so when we move from monolith to microservice architecture, how do we handle the challenges of distributed tracing? Um, you know, that's last, uh, last, last question. <laughs> brilliant. Yes. Uh, I, I know you're right. We, we already hit the five after, but yes. Um, great question. I, yeah, I think that, I uh, you know, tracing is, um, can pay real dividends or after, after the investments put in, it typically does tend to be a very large investment to get the initial set of um, uh, payback um, on that investment. So, uh, you know, I think like the, the, I, I would kind of optimize for getting um, as much tracing capability as possible with the minimal amount of like custom changes to your applications, because uh, at first at least, um, and using things like open telemetry, which has, um, uh, uh, middleware to install into um, like your gRPC handlers or your HTTP handlers and can handle the context propagation for you is, is ideal here. Um, but, you know, you really want to invest in like minimal change to your custom applications because going and asking every engineering team to go do work that's custom is is a huge cost to most um, organizations, um, and and get the you know maximum output of that and just at least start to to get it as widely propagated as possible. But you know it's it's a it's a, it's a battle. Awesome, I think uh, I think we covered a lot of ground there, Rob. That was fantastic. <laughs> And uh, I definitely learned a lot. So I'm going to share my screen real quick. Let's see here. Um, so I, we will send this out. Um, I, I'm sure there's some people that are gonna be interested in this, uh, Rob. So we'll, we'll share this. I think you had something to do with this. <laughs> right, yes. This is a, this is a, a fun case study, um, which uh, it's interesting and it, 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 it's, um, the, the world's even come a long way from the year or two in which this was written. <laughs> really? Okay. Um, and then I noticed here, this was a, a while ago. Uh, I just pulled this up, but uh, it looks like you've written that article when you were at Uber back in the day. And um, so I'm not too, too familiar with, with M3, but it looks like uh, this for everyone that's still with us. And thank you for those who are still with us. Uh, you can find some more information here. Are you still involved with this, Rob? Or uh, yes, I thought as a CTO you wouldn't write code, but uh, I am uh, <laughs> still a weekly to monthly committer sometimes um, okay. of the project. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, your Prometheus has caught on like wildfire, and all of the remote storage um, of uh, options that are out there in open source are all have their own benefits to them and um you know uh central center of like cent central focuses right. so you know we thought we would see consolidation amongst that and like there would be kind of like main one single main um open source remote storage option for scaling out um a really large deploy deployment on cloud native of your prometheus metrics um but you know i, I think it's actually super cool to see the fact that like it's actually quite a lot of cho choice out there with a lot of active development. M3 is very, very actively developed um, uh, and powers uh, Uber, 
Walmart, Databricks, um, and also also our cloud product at Chronosphere. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. And uh, I know a lot of people um, ask us, Rob, how to get involved in these open source projects. Do you have any very quick uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I would say that um, you know CNCF is is fantastic uh, in terms of just like every project is is has governance um, that makes it quite easy mm -hmm. to get involved. Um, uh, M three particular, if, if you're interested in, mm -hmm. in um, submitting a PR, we are uh, very very open. And love to have conversations that are, um, are on our open source Slack, um, which uh, mm -hmm. you can find um, and. I think it's somewhere on the readme there. So um, mm -hmm. where we obviously, yeah, love contributions, work closely with folks that um, want to modify M3 and, and add things that, that um, uh, so for instance, the InfluxDB protocol was uh, support for writing metrics into M3 natively was um, donated from uh, the community. So um, yeah, I, I would say find the slacks Slack. are great. The slacks, mm -hmm. I mean, even the CNCF slacks, fantastic if you, uh, want to get involved in any of the CNCF projects. Um, it usually starts as an end user, but then quite quickly you find uh, yourself needing something from the project that's not there. And most of the community um, driven projects are just, you know, really um, super happy to see people getting involved. So Slack's been a, a great uh, IRC. I love IRC and, you know, I um, still have an IRC client, um, but uh I think that Slack's just made it a lot easier for folks to um, get involved uh, easily. And uh, I mean, it's it's like poison, but you can use it from your phone quite easily as well. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so uh, thank you for that, Rob. And uh, this is our community. Again, if anybody uh, wants to join, all are welcome. Definitely want to have you. And this is our next event, which is next week. So we're cranking them out this month. We have an event every week. So this is going to be next Thursday. And um, yeah, so we'll be sending, be on the lookout for that. We'll send out some information. And again, Rob, we can't thank you enough. Uh, we would love to have you come back again uh, sometime in the future. I know you're pretty crazy busy with a lot going on, but um, uh, we'd love to keep in touch with you. And yeah, I hope to see you around. Likewise, also great to uh, Rajesh uh, do this presentation with you and Josh for for hosting um, the the event. It's a fantastic meetup. Um, props to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Rajesh. Thank you. Take yeah, care thank, now. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. All right, bye bye. Bye. See ya. Bye. See ya.